parts of a computer, classifications of computers, uh, history of computing or history of computers, or the early development of computers, then areas where computers are used, then computer laboratory or computer lab, and lastly, we shall look at um, uh, how computer boots. Uh, we shall also look at the mouse and the and the keyboard. Therefore, let's go straight to our topic. And therefore, uh, today computers are used in various places for various reasons or uses. For example, uh, in your homes, you use computers for entertainment, for that is for playing games, for watching movies, uh, for playing music, and uh, other entertainment related activities now in banks computers are used for security purposes like for controlling the cctvs and also for keeping safe the customer details we also have retail stores or shops uh, where we use computers for uh, stock control uh, among others uh, it's also very crucial it's also very crucial and very important uh, for us to know what is a computer and therefore we shall look at the definition of a computer when you talk about a computer a computer is an electronic device that operates or works under the control of instructions called programs stored in its own memory unit on the other hand somebody else may say that a computer is an electronic uh, machine that processes raw data to give information as output. Also, it's not wrong to say that an, uh, an a computer is an electronic device that accepts data as input and transform it under the influence of a set of special instructions called programs to produce the desired output referred to as information. I think the third definition makes a lot of sense and also uh, it is very powerful that a uh, computer is an electronic device that accepts data as input and transform it under the influence of, of a set of special instructions called programs to produce desired output called information. And therefore, it is also uh, very important to note, somebody may ask you, why is a computer referred as an electronic device and therefore the answer is simple a computer is described as an electronic device because it is made up of electronic components that is one answer answer number two it uses electric energy such as electricity to operate therefore those are the two main reasons uh, among others that uh, uh, why we refer a computer as an electronic uh, device then we also need to know some of the terms or terminologies related to computing. Therefore, we have agreed that computer convert input, that is data, uh, through the help of special instructions called program, that is the processing to give information. And therefore we have data. Data is a collection of raw facts, figures or instructions that do not have much meaning to the user. Data may be in form of numbers, alphabets, letters, symbols, and can be processed to produce information. And therefore, if you are asked what is data, simply data refers to low facts. Then we have the act of data processing. It is the process of collecting all items of data together and converting them into information. Processing refers to the process, uh, refers to the way the data is manipulated or handled to turn into information. The processing may involve calculation, comparison, or any other logic to, pro uh, to produce the required result. The processing of the data usually results in some meaningful information being processed, and therefore, Data processing is the act of converting data to information. And therefore, what is information? In simple terms, information is the data which has been refined, summarized, 
and manipulated in the way you want it or into a more meaningful form for decision making. Rather, the information must be accurate, timely, complete and relevant. Then we go on and on and then uh, we have now known what is data and therefore uh, it is also crucial for us to know. Now that we know data it refers to raw facts, what are the types of data that a computer can process? There are two types or forms of data that computer usually process. It can process digital data, we also call it discrete. On the other hand, computer can also process analog or continuous data. And therefore, digital data is discrete in nature. That means it is non-continuous. The word discrete means non-continuous. It must be represented in the form of numbers, alphabets or symbols for it to be processed by a computer. Digital data obtained uh, by counting like now one two three on the other hand analog or continuous data or non-discrete uh, some books will uh, call it non-discrete analog data is continuous in nature it must be represented in physical nature in order to be processed by the computer analog data is obtained by measurement uh, for example pressure you can measure temperature, humidity, length, or currents. The output is in the form of smooth graphs uh, from which the data can be read. Then uh, we, we need to go and look at the physical parts of a computer. Now physical means uh, something that you can touch. And therefore, uh, if you look at this diagram here, we have the as a, a diagram of a computer it's not actually a photo but a, a drone diagram and therefore the uh, upper post uppermost part from the diagram we call it the monitor the monitor is the screen that's where you get uh, to know what is happening then we have the system unit as part of the computer you also have the mouse you have the keyboard and sometimes you may include a printer then you can go ahead and look at the explanations of these parts. And therefore, we have the keyboard. You have seen the keyboard. Now the keyboard looks like a typewriter and has letters, numbers, and other keys through which data is entered into the computer. To enter data and instruction into the computer, the user should press the required keys. Therefore, a keyboard, it just looks like a typewriter where you press letters to give instructions to the computer. Then we have the mouse. It just looks like the animal mouse. It is a pointing device that enables the user to issue instructions to the computer by controlling a special mouse pointer displayed on the screen. And therefore, a mouse is just a pointing device it allows you to give instructions to the computer. Then we have the monitor. The monitor, it is a television-like screen used for displaying output. When you type a letter or a number on the keyboard, it shows up on the monitor. Note, the monitor enables the user to monitor or track. To monitor is to track or see what is going on in the computer. And therefore, somebody may ask you, why is the computer screen referred to as the monitor? The answer is here. It enables the user to track or see what is going on in the computer. Therefore, never fail that question. Then we have the printer. Printers are used to create permanent copies of output on a paper. Therefore, that one is also uh, very crucial. Then we have the system unit. The system unit is uh, that part that looks like um, it looks like a, uh, that is the, the system unit you can see it here. It looks like a house. It is actually a house. It is a house that ha houses the drives and other important parts like the brain of the computer. Then to wrap that part, you should actually know that 
all devices connected to the system unit through special cables, we call them interface cables, like the mouse, the keyboard, the printer, we call them peripheral devices. And therefore, if somebody asks you to define the term peripheral device, then you will say that these are all devices connected to the system unit via special cables called interface cables. On the other hand, let's look in depth the system unit. This is the casing or unit that houses electronic components such as the brain. The brain is the CPU of the computer that is the central processing unit. The components in the system unit, what are found inside the system unit? That can be a very good question in any exam that gives the components uh, that are found in the system unit. Number one, never forget it is the brain. It is the central processing unit or CPU. So the CPU or the brain of the computer is also called the processor. Then inside the system unit, you will get the motherboard you will get the power supply unit, you will get the memories, and also you will get the disk drives, the, like the hard disk where we keep data. You will get the CD-ROMs, those ones are the CD drives, the DVD drives, the ones that you use to read movies. Then we have two main types of system units. We have tower style unit and desktop unit. You will see them in the next slide. Therefore, we have a system unit that looks like a house, like a tall house, like KICC or Times Tower in Nairobi. That is tower, a tower. It looks like a story building. Then we, we have the one that is actually lying, that is called desktop uh, units. Therefore, let's look at them. Therefore, these are the photos of system units. Um, we have the desktop, that one, you are familiar with that one, you can look at your computer lab and see, we usually have those ones, and the tower, the tower is the one that is actually uh, standing up. Then uh, from that point, it is very crucial for us to look at the characteristics uh, of uh, computer, characteristics are actually features, what make computer better than human being, that's how the examiner will reset that question. Why are computers better than human beings? And therefore, you will give these ones are the advantages. These are also the significance. These are also the advantages or components or characteristics of a computer. Number one, consistency. Computers are usually consistent. This means that given the same data and the same instructions, they will produce the same answer every time that particular process is repeated. That is very good. If you give a computer a certain data and you don't change it and then ask for a result, it will give you the same result even if you, uh, you repeat that million times. Then storage. Computer is capable of storing large amount of data or instructions in a very limited space. That is very true. Therefore, that is another characteristics of a uh, computer that makes it better than human being. Then we have diligence. Unlike human beings, a computer can work continuously without getting tired or bored. Now assume a situation whereby I tell you to calculate one plus one million times, you will get angry. But a computer will do that without complaining. That is diligence. It will repeat something without getting tired or bored. Then automation. A computer is automatic device. This is because once given the instructions, it is guided by these instructions and can carry on its job automatically and treat it is until it is complete. That is self-explanatory. You don't need actually to start there for computer to uh, go on and on doing something. You just tell it to do and then you, you go for your own business and come for the results. Then we have speed. Compare computer uh, doing calculations or even an ATM, an ATM machine counting money and uh, dispersing, uh, dispatching money to customers compared to a terror human being uh, seated there in the bank. We'll take, for example, 10 minutes to serve one customer 
whereas an ATM will serve 10 people within that 10 minutes, one minute per person, or for example, even five, that is uh, twice or even thrice what the, uh, the human being can do. Therefore, speed. Computer operate at a very high speed and can perform very many functions within a very short time. On the other hand, when you talk about accuracy, unlike human beings, computers are very accurate. They never make mistakes. A computer can work for very long periods without going wrong. However, when an error occurs, the computer has a number of inbuilt self-checking features in their electronic components that can detect and correct such errors. Usually, errors are committed by the user entering the data to the computer. Thus, the saying, garbage in, garbage out, or G-I-G-O. Some people will call it GIGO. Garbage in, garbage out. That means if you make a mistake when keying data to the computer, then the computer will still give wrong results. That's why we say garbage in, garbage out. Then we have reliability. Unlike human beings, you may uh, want a human, to meet a human being, but because of the nature of human being, he or she uh, doesn't turn up. But a computer, so long as there is power and it is functional, it is reliable. Reliability. The computer can be relied upon to produce the correct answer if it, it is given the correct instructions and supplied with the correct data. Versatile. Versatile means a computer can be used in different places to perform a large number of different jobs depending on the instructions fed to it. When a computer can be used in the hospital, it can be used in games department, it can be used in entering marks, can be used in the accounts office. Therefore, it is actually versatile or flexible. Then everything that exists on earth has a history and uh, without a history, there is no today. Now, many years ago, you may ask yourself, where did the computers come from? Uh, everything has a history. Even yourself, you can ask yourself, where, where do I come from? Which county, where? Therefore, a computer also has history. Now, before 1900, most data processing was done manually using simple tools like stones, uh, sticks to keep records. You can assume a situation whereby people used to count even using their fingers. They could uh, count stones, sticks. Around uh, 2000 years ago, Asian merchants came up with a special calculating tool called abacus that could be used to calculate large figures. An abacus is made up of rectangular frames and a crossbar at the middle. It is fitted with wires or strings running across from the frame to the crossbar. How to represent a number using uh, an abacus? I'll be showing you in, uh, later on. Each bit in the, row, in the row has a value of 1, while each bit in the upper row, that is, each bit in the lower row has a value of 1 where each bit in the upper row has a value of 5. To represent a number, the bit is moved to the crossbar. Those bits away from the crossbar represents 0. Now, after Abacus, the first machine that usually regarded as the forerunner of modern computers was named the analytical engine and was developed by an English mathematician called Charles Babbage or Charles Babbage. In 1939, Professor Harvard Aiken of Harvard University designed the first computer-like machine named Mark I. Since then, a series of advancements in the electronics has occurred. With each breakthrough, the computers based on the older forms of the electronics have been replaced by a new generation of computers based on the new forms of electronics. Now let's see how an abacus looks like. Therefore, you can uh, see how we have represented 6908, that is 6908. Therefore, we have agreed that the center line is called the crossbar. 
and each bit above the crossbar has a value of 5. Each bit below the crossbar has a value of 1, but they have to be moved closer to the uh, to the cr uh, closer to the crossbar for them to be counted. Like now, eight. You can see we have one one bit above that represents five, and three below uh, that are very close to the crossbar, representing and uh, making it an eight. Then uh, from there, uh, there is an assignment here for you. Assignment still on the history of computers. Read about Pascarine machine, who invented Pascarine and what purpose was it for. Uh, also read about slide rule and also read about Napier bones. They are also a uh, part of the history of computers. Therefore, apart from Abacus, apart from analytical engine, we have Pascarine machine, we have slide rule and also Napier bones. That is your assignment. That is food for thought. Then let's go now to today's computer. Electronic computers, that is our next subtopic. Now, after Abacus, the first machine that is usually regarded as the forerunner of modern computers was named the analytical engine, invented by Charles Babbage. And therefore, if you are asked who is the father of modern computers, simple, the answer is Charles Babbage. Then from there, we can go to computer generations. A computer generation is a grouped summary of gradual developments in the computer technology. The historical events are not considered in terms of individual years, but are classified in durations, a period of more than one year. Therefore, we shall be looking at computer generations in the next slide. We have uh, five generations so far. We have first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. And therefore, a computer generation is a grouped summary of the gradual developments in the computer technology. Therefore, let's go one on one now and look at the first generation of computers. First generation of computers, this was developed between 1940s to 1956. Various books will give various uh, uh, duration there, but it should be between 1940 to 1956. Now, the first generation of computers used thousands of electronic gadgets called vacuum tubes or lamionic valves to store and process information. And therefore, a question will be posted for you to give the technologies that were used in first generation of computers. And therefore, the answer should be vacuum tubes or lamionic valves. That was uh, the, the engine behind its operation. Now, the tubes consumed a lot of power and generated a lot of heat during processing due to overheating. Therefore, some of these points I'm reading are the characteristics of first generation of computers. The computers constantly broke down due to the excessive heat generated, hence were short-lived and were not very reliable. They also used magnetic drum memories. Therefore, you can also mark that. They used magnetic drum memories. Cards were used to enter data into the computer. Their internal memory capacity was limited up to two kilobytes. The computers used big physical devices uh, in their circuitry. Hence, they were very large in size. Therefore, those are some of the um, characteristics of uh, fast generation of computers. So let's see examples of first generation of computers. Examples, we have X War 2, we had um, Inva Edvac, which means electronic discrete variable automatic computer. We also have Univac, universal automatic computer. We also had IBM 650. We had Leon, which stands for Leon's electronic office. We also had ENIAC, that is Electronic Numerical Integrator and Calculator. The photos ones, you can write them down and read and read and read. There is no shortcut to know them. It's just reading and reading and reading. Then we can go ahead and look at the second generation of computers. And therefore, the second generation of computers, 
they used tiny solid state electronic devices called transistors. Therefore, first generation used the gamonic valves or vacuum tubes, but now this one, they used transistors. The computer consumed less power, produced less heat, were much faster and more reliable than those now in first generation. They used magnetic core memories. The RAM size expanded to that 2 kilobytes. The operation speed uh, increased between 200,000 to, to 300,000 instructions per second. The computers were smaller in size uh, compared to first generation. Then we also have that they were less costly compared now to first generation. Examples we had Univac 1107, we had Atlas Rail Mark 3. And the others, the IBM 1401, IBM 7070, those ones you need to read and read and read about them. Then from there, uh, we can proceed to the third generation of computers. Uh, we are still going on and on. And therefore, uh, these ones used integrated circuits. Therefore, make sure you are following how we are going from vacuum tubes, from transistors, and now to integrated circuits. The processing speed increased to 5 million instructions per second. That is the other one we have seen were between 200,000 to 300,000. But now this one is 5 million instructions per second. The storage capacity of the computers also expanded to 2 MB. They were smaller in size compared to second generation. The computers used uh, a wide range of peripheral devices. Peripheral devices, we have a grid. These are devices attached to the system unit like mouse, keyboard, and others. The computers could support more than, uh, more than one user at a time. They were also able to support remote communication facilities. Magnetic disks were developed for storage. Therefore, you can also see another innovation here, magnetic disks. Examples of that generation of computers, we have IBM 360, 370, ICL 1900 series, uh, PDP, Raven mainframes, uh, blah, 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 blah. Therefore, make sure you uh, read uh, and read and read about uh, this part of the generations. Then we are almost now going to where we are today. We have now the fourth generation of computers, now 1971 to 1990. Therefore, make sure you mark even the years range. We have agreed it's a group of years. Now we have come all the way from vacuum tubes, transistors, uh, integrated circuits. Now we are at large scale integrated circuit, very large scale integrated circuits. And therefore, the fourth generation of computers used very large scale integrated circuits. The circuits were made by compressing more tiny circuits and transistors into even smaller space of the silicon chip or chipset. The computers were small, they were very fast. Their processing speed increased to 50 million instructions per second. Now the other one was 5 million. Had large storage capacity. Their memory sizes expanded to several hundred megabytes. Memories used included magnetic disks, bubble memories, and optical disks. Therefore, you can still see the invention of now bubble memories and optical disks in the fourth generation of computers. Examples we had IBM 308, IBM 4300, Adhan 580, Honeywell DPS 88, Boros, uh, blah, blah, blah. Those are some of the, uh, gener the examples of those machines. Then we have uh, fifth generation of computers, that is uh, years 1990 to present. In this generation, uh, today's computer falls here. The technologies used are parallel architectures, three-dimensional circuit design, and uh, superconducting materials. We call them superconductors. Also, these machines support artificial intelligence or AI. These technologies have led to the development of computers referred to as supercomputers, which are very powerful and have very high processing speeds. Their speeds are measured in nanoseconds or picoseconds. They are able to perform parallel, uh, that is multiprocessing. They can do several things at the same time. 
their memory size is range between 1 GB to 1 DB. So, uh, it's actually, uh, we are talking of 1 GB, 2 GB, 8 GB, that way, the machines that we have today. The computers are designed using uh, the technology of very large, uh, that is the, we call it, let's just call it the microchip technology that has given rise to the smaller computers known as microcomputers used today. And therefore, if you ask what is a microcomputer, it is the smallest and the most affordable machine like the one you have in your, your, your computer app. The computers, that is the fifth generation, have special instruction set that allow them to support complex programs that mimic, to mimic is to imitate human intelligence. Therefore, the act of imitating human intelligence is called artificial intelligence or AI. That is in capital letter. Then from there, let's go ahead and look at classification of computers. Now, how do we classify computers? Computers can be classified according to the following parameters. You can uh, classify computers according to the physical size and processing power. That is how large they are, how fast they are, purpose of which they are designed, functionality or method or mode of operation. Therefore, we have those three points, physical size, uh, purpose, and functionality. Then we go one-on-one -on -one and uh, look at each and every uh, classification. And therefore, classification according to physical size. We have said this is how large the machines are. And therefore, computers can be classified into five in this category. We have the largest ever known computer that was called supercomputers. Then... Supercomputers were followed by mainframes, mainframe computers, which was followed by mini computer, which was followed by what we have today, that is micro. Micro means small. And therefore, micro, we have portable computers like laptop, notepads, or palm tops. Then uh, we can look at some of the features of supercomputers. Now, supercomputer is referred as the most powerful computer ever most powerful computer available. They are very fast in processing. Most uh, supercomputers are fastest, largest, most expensive, and also they use uh, multiple processors. In this case, a single task is split among the processors for faster execution. However, all the processors are controlled by a single central processor. Supercomputers generate a lot of heat and therefore require special cooling systems. Sometimes the whole CPU is dipped into a tank containing liquid fluorocarbon to provide the cooling. Supercomputers are very large and heavy and are usually kept under special environment conditions or a special room. Therefore, that is a very important uh, concept. They are operated by computer specialists a supercomputer can be operated by over 500 users at the same time. We have said it usually have many processors. Now, areas where supercomputers are used. Supercomputers are used in scientific applications that involve heavy calculations. It can be used for weather forecasting, petroleum research, defense and weapon analysis. It can also be used uh, for simulation, that is in science. Then we have the sister to that one. Uh, we call it the mainframes. Now, the mainframe are less powerful compared now to the supercomputers. They are big in size, but smaller than supercomputers. They are powerful computers with very high capacities of main storage. They have a very high processing speed. They can support a large number of peripheral devices. They can handle hundreds of users at the same time. Mainframe computers are general purpose and can handle all kinds of problems, whether scientific or commercial. Areas where mainframes are used. Therefore, mainframes are mostly used in government uh, departments uh, for processing. It, they are used in banks, hospitals. They are used in communication networks like internet. They are also used by airline reservation systems. Then you have mini computers. Now, mini computers, a mini computer is physically smaller than a mainframe. However, 
it can support the same peripheral devices supported by mainframe. A mini computer can support several users at a time, it can be operated by, uh, by six uh, users at the uh, same time. Several workstations through terminals are connected to one central mini computer so that the users connected can share resources. Microcomputers are easier to uh, are easier to manufacture and maintain compared to mainframes. Many computers are cheap, cheaper than the mainframes, but more costly than the microcomputers. They had small amounts of data, are less powerful, and has less memory than main, uh, mainframes. Therefore, basically, when you are doing the comparison, compare with the data. Always compare with the data, and also you can compare with the one that is actually uh, coming up. Areas where microcomputers are used, they are used in scientific laboratories and research institutions, uh, engineering plants, they are used for space industry, insurance companies and banks. Therefore, those are some of the uh, some of the areas where they are actually uh, used. Then we have microcomputers. Now a microcomputer are the PC. PC stands for personal computer. From today onwards, when you get the term PC, it is allowed, it is, uh, it is personal computer, and therefore uh, we can call microcomputers, these are the computers we have today, we can call them PC, personal computer. Therefore, microcomputers are PCs, mostly found today in homes, schools, and many small offices. They are called personal computers or PCs because they are designed to be used by one person at a time. They consist of very, uh, very few connected units that is, can support few, uh, few peripheral devices. The data processing in microcomputer is done by a microprocessor, that is the CPU. Microcomputers are small in size. They are cheaper than my mini computers. Uh, that is given. They are less powerful. You cannot compare today's machine with uh, the bigger ones that we have talked about. The bigger ones are actually uh, powerful. Then, areas where microcomputers are used, they are used in training. Like now, we, I am training you using a microcomputer. Even in your school, at your home, you are also playing computer game using microcomputers. Therefore, they are used for communication. You can send your friend emails. You can chat in WhatsApp or PC. You can telegram search. They are also used in small businesses like cyber cafes and others. Therefore, those are some of the areas where uh, we use the microcomputers. Now, some of the microcomputers we have today, we have laptops, we have notepads, we have palm tops, we have desktop computers. Those are some of the uh, some of the examples of microcomputers. Therefore, we are done. Uh, with classification according to physical size and processing power. Next, let's see this very interesting subtopic, classification according to purpose. Purpose is the use, or uh, yeah, it's actually the use, the term is the use. And therefore, in this category, we classify computers according to general purpose, special purpose, and dedicated computers. Now, general purpose, just like the term goes general, General purpose computers are designed to perform a wide variety of tasks. They use specifically written instructions or programs to carry out the desired processing tasks. Example, a single computer can be used to process documents, perform calculations, process the payroll, simulate the loading of a bridge, process insurance policies, play games, among others. Therefore, you can see that a general purpose computer, like the one you have, you can do all these things using it. Then we have special purpose computer. Special, just like the word goes special, it is for specific task. A special purpose computer is designed to handle or accomplish a particular specific task only. Such computers cannot perform any other task except the one they were meant to do. Therefore, programs which are used in special purpose computers are fixed. They are hardwired 
at the time of manufacture. For example, in a computer network, the front end processor is only used to control the communication of information between the various workstations at the uh, host computer. A special purpose computer is dedicated to a single task. Hence, it can perform it quickly and very efficiently. Now, examples of special purpose computers, so that you can now understand them very well. Now, look at a petrol pump. Computers used in petrol pump. You cannot uh, go and go go in a, a petrol in a petrol pump in a computer in the petrol pump. You cannot go and watch a movie there. Therefore, a computer used in washing machines. Uh, look at uh, automatic pilot, uh, autopilot in the in the airplanes. Look at a robot in the industry used in manufacturing industry. If a robot is used in car manufacturing, it cannot be used in uh, parking sodas in Coca-Cola company. Mobile phones and calculators and others. And also we have digital watches, some of the examples. Now lastly, on classification according to purpose, we have dedicated computer. What is a dedicated computer? A dedicated computer is a general purpose computer that is committed to some processing task, though capable of performing a variety of tasks in different application environment. Therefore, it is just a general purpose computer, but for this case now, it is dedicated for only one task. For example, the computer can be dedicated to carrying out word processing task only. That doesn't mean it cannot play movies. It can, but it has been set aside to only uh, do one task. Our last classification on this is classification according to functionality. And therefore, for this category, we have digital computers, analog computers, and hybrid. Therefore, digital computers. This is the most commonly used type of computer today. A digital computer is a computer that operates on discrete data only. We have looked at uh, uh, discrete data. Discrete means non-continuous. It can process both numeric, alphanumeric data within the computer. Therefore, digital computers are computers that function or operate on non-continuous or discrete data. On the other hand, on the other hand, we have the uh, we have the analog computers. Now, analog computers, these are computers that operate on continuous data. Therefore, as simple as that, you need to know that analog computers are computers that operate on continuous data. They carry out their data processing by measuring the amount of change that occurs in physical attributes or quantities, such as change in electrical voltage, speed, currents, pressure, length, temperature, humidities, blah, 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 those ones. Those are some of the, uh, the uses of that. Then lastly, we have the hybrid. Now, hybrid means a combination of several. And therefore, a hybrid computer is a combination of analog and digital. And therefore, they are designed to process both analog and digital data. They combine both the functionalities of digital and analog computers. Therefore, like in the hospital uh, intensive care unit, ICU, an analog device uh, may be used to measure the functionality of patient's heart, temperature, and other vital signs. These measurements may then be converted into numbers and sent to a digital device for manipulation. Therefore, that's, you can look at the how now the how now the, the, the hybrid uh, whatever is coming in. Then we have now the areas where computers are used. You are so much uh, conversant with this one. You are so much conversant with the um, areas where computers are used and therefore computers are used in many places. Like now we shall enumerate several though we cannot exhaustively say that we have covered everything. Now in supermarkets Supermarkets and other retail uh, stores use computers for stock control, that is to help them manage their daily activities. Uh, we have industries. Uh, these uh, 
in industries, we have gadgets like robots. Uh, we also have conveyor belt machines. They are controlled by computers. Then, therefore, in industries, computers are used to control robots and also for process control. Uh, they also are used for process control. Then we also have the banks and insurance companies. Uh, in these places, computers are used for processing checks, preparation of payroll, uh, record keeping, money transfer facilities, etc. Then we also have process control. Computers are used in production environment such as factories to control chemical and mechanical uh, processes. Then we have hospitals. Hospital, in hospitals, computers are, are used to keep and retrieve patients' records, also for controlling CCTVs and also for doing other medical uh, analysis. Then we have offices. Uh, computers are used for keeping records, production of documents, for receiving and sending emails, that is for receiving communications. Then we have government institutions. Computers are also used there for uh, actually, the main purpose is record keeping. Now, in education, just like we are doing now, I am reaching you through use of computers. Therefore, in education, we have computer-aided learning. We also have computer-aided teaching, like I am doing. We also have e-learning, where now I can upload these uh, notes and then you read. In that case, you shall be doing e-learning. And therefore, computers are used for such stuff in education. Then research. Now I have given you assignment to read about uh, Slider, um, Pascarine, and Napier bones. How will you do that? You use a computer, even if it's a mobile phone, it's also a computer, you'll be using it for research. Therefore, you can Google, uh, you can ask friends, you can chat and get uh, uh, data, that is research. Then communication industry. The integration of computer and telecommunication facilities has made the transmission and reception of messages very fast and efficient. They are used in telephone exchanges to switch incoming and outcoming, and that is an, an outgoing cause. In transport industry, just right now in automobile traffic control, railway cooperation like the SGR, shipping controls, computers are used for efficient management of fleets and communication, also to coordinate the movement of goods and wagons, to monitor vehicle traffic in BC road towns. Therefore, that is uh, as far as transport industry is, uh, is concerned. Then in police and defense, uh, when a police arrest somebody, they take fingerprints and therefore the criminal records can be kept where and for future reference in police uh, machines. Defense, computers are used in electronic news gathering, efficient communication, detecting and tracking of targets in radar system, warning system, and in guided mis missile system. Computers are used in military defense equipment, e.g. fighter jets, rockets, and bombers. That is in defense. Then we have domestic and entertainment system. At your home, you can watch movies, you can store personal information, you can keep your home budgets, that is for at home or in domestic uh, use. Then there is this uh, also very, 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 very interesting part. Now, where do you study your computer? Uh, you were just telling me I study computer in the computer laboratory. And therefore, what is this computer laboratory? Therefore, we need to have this one in depth. What is a computer laboratory? And therefore, our next subtopic is computer laboratory definition as many people will give various definitions which are correct and therefore uh, we shall look at what is computer laboratory a computer lab or a computer laboratory is a room that has been specially prepared to facilitate installation of computers and provide a safe conducive environment for teaching and learning of computer studies. I like that definition. It is actually uh, uh, very well praised. Then, safe use and care of computers. That is the computer hygiene. Computer systems are expensive to acquire and maintain and should therefore be handled with great care. Most computer breaks are down uh, most computer breakdowns are caused by failure to follow the correct instructions 
on use of equipment, carelessness and neglect. Computer hygiene involves keeping the computers in good care and order. Then, somebody may pose a question. We want to come up with a computer lab in your school if you don't have one. And if you have one, you want to come up with a better one. What factors should you consider? The following are factors to consider when preparing a computer laboratory. Number one is the security of computers. You cannot just uh, create a, that is build a computer lab where there is uh, no security. Machines will be stolen. Therefore, security of computer hardware and software. Number two, you cannot uh, bring up a computer lab where there is no power. Therefore, number one is security of computers. Number two is reliability, source, reliability of source of power or availability of source of power. Then, when you are preparing a computer lab, you have to ask yourself, how many computers will be accommodated in that room? You cannot bring 100 computers in a very small room. How will the computers be installed? And you cannot also take three computers in a very large room. It will be a waste of space. And therefore, number of computers to be installed and the amount of floor space available. Then the next point is the maximum number of users. Therefore, also ask yourself when you are constructing the computer app, how many users am I uh, actually targeting? Also, that one can apply when you are setting up a cyber cafe. Then let's look at the safety precautions and practices in a computer laboratory. The following rules must be followed in and around a computer laboratory. Number one, only authorized people should enter the computer lab. Secondly, remove your shoes before entering the computer lab to prevent dust. Now this is not a must, but it depends with your school policy. Avoid smoking or exposing computers to dust. Now this one also applies to college students who smoke. This is because smoke and dust contain small abrasive particles that can damage computer components and cause wearing off the moving parts. Do not carry foods such as uh, coffee, chocolate, chewing gums, drinks and beverages to computer up. Food particles may fall in the moving parts of the computer and damage them. Liquid may spill into the computer parts, ca uh, causing rusting or electrical faults or short circuiting, which can bring fire. Collect any waste materials, e.g. paper bits, which might be lying in the computer room, and put them in the dustbin. Avoid unnecessary movement. Here I repeat, avoid unnecessary movements, because you may accidentally knock down the peripheral devices. Computer users should be trained on how to use computers frequently. Computer irritates should not be allowed to operate the computer. Then shut the door of the computer room properly when actually you are leaving the, the room. Then there is assignment for you here. Uh, just a food for thought. How can we prevent fire in a computer app? Number two, how can we protect our eyes when we are in a computer lab? How should computer lab be read? That is the amount of light or even the paints that are in the walls. Therefore, take that one as food for thought, though some may, uh, may be answered as I go on and on. Then, starting and shutting down the computer. Always follow the proper procedure for starting and shutting down the computer to avoid loss of data and damage to computer programs. Avoid turning on and off frequently as it is harmful. Every time a computer is turned on, the internal components get heated and again cool down when the computer is turned off. As a result, the circuit boards expand and contract and this can badly affect the, the solder joints of the computer. Do not open up the metallic covers of computers or peripheral devices without permission and particularly when the computer's power is still on. Mark that one. Then protection against fire and accidents. Fire outbreaks in the laboratory can be caused by either inflammable chemicals such uh, as those used in cleaning 
servicing the computer equipment, electric faults such as open wires or cables smoking, keep the chemicals away in a store after using them to avoid any accidents, ensure that all electric wires are properly insulated, open wires or cables must be properly covered with an insulating tape or replaced with the new ones as they can cause fire leading to bad damage of equipment. The computer room must always have gaseous fire extinguisher, especially those containing carbon four oxide or carbon dioxide in the case of any accident. Therefore, never use water or powder, and that is noted here. Water, paste or powder fire extinguishers should not be used in the computer room because they can cause damage to computer components as follows. Water causes rusting of the metallic parts and short circuits, while powder particles normally settle on storage devices and may scratch them during lead and write operations. Any incident that may result in damage to equipment should be reported to the person in charge of the computer laboratory. This is a very, very, very uh, crucial part uh, that is damaging, uh, that is fire and accident. That one should actually uh, be the main core value on this topic. No student should attempt to repair the equipment as they may lead to complete damage of the equipment. Therefore, any damage should be, any mis malfunction should be, should be reported uh, to the person in charge of the computer laboratory. Then, okay, insulation of cables. All power cables in the computer room must be properly insulated and read away from busy pathways in the room. That is, preferably around the walls. This prevents the user from stumbling on the cables, which might cause electric shock or power interruptions. System cables should be of the best quality and type and should also be properly crept or fixed. The cables should be hardened carefully, especially at the end, to avoid breaking the pins. Then there is this also very important part about the stable power supply. It can be very disturbing when power keeps on uh, uh, actually disturbing you on and off. Stable power supply. Computers are delicate devices that require a stable source of power. Ensure that there is a steady flow of input power to the computer in order to prevent loss of data or information and also prevent damaging the computer's secondary storage media. Note, power from main supply is not always stable and may sometimes experience power surges or at a voltage, also called brownout. To protect the computer from being damaged due to power instabilities, especially in areas where power fluctuates, avoid connecting it directly to the main supply. Instead, it is important to connect the computer to a special power collection equipment or device such as stabilizer or an interruptible power supply source called UPS. UPS, it stands for interruptible power supply unit. Then connect the UPS to the main power supply. Therefore, later on, you will be getting that diagram. This is the diagram. Now look at what, how you should actually connect your computer. We have that gadget there called UPS, an interruptible power supply uh, system. And therefore, power from the main should be connected directly to the UPS. Then the computer should be connected now from this UPS. That is for stable power. Therefore, you can see this unstable power and the stable power, how uh, that one uh, actually works. Therefore, the UPS gets charged when the power um, that is main is uh, that is the power main is on when the main power goes off the ups gives some sound usually a beep to alert the user that the power is off and therefore let's look at the functions of that gadget up there called an interruptible power supply unit or ups the first function of the ups it regulates power from unstable power source to the required clean stable voltage. Secondly, it prevents power surges and brownouts that might destroy the computer. Thirdly, 
it temporarily provides power to the computer in the case of the main power failure. This allows the user to save his or her work and shut down the computer using the correct procedure. Number three, and most important, it alerts the user of any power loss, and therefore it makes you to manage yourself and know that the power is actually uh, power is actually uh, going off. Then we have bagra proofing. Bagra is a thief, and therefore when we are talking about uh, bagra proofing, this is the face, uh, this is the uh, uh, measures taken to prevent uh, breaking into a computer lab. Now, physical access to computer room should be rest restricted to ensure that only authorized persons get access to the computers. To prevent unauthorized access to computer room, the following controls should be implemented. That is bagra proofing. Number one, fit strong metallic glues or rocks on doors, windows, and roofs. Number two, rock the doors. Number three, avoid overcoming strangers in the computer app. Number four, use a personal identification card to get into the app. Use fingerprint identification if it is available. Install security alarms. You can also employ security guards. Use special voice recorders that would be able to analyze the voice of trespasser and check against the database containing the voice patterns of varied users. That is an adversity one. Secure stroke protect computers with the passwords to minimize chances of data theft. Then on the other hand, we have ventilation. Both computers and human beings emit heat energy into the environment. Therefore, the computer room must have good circulation of air to avoid overheating and suffocation. Proper ventilation enables the computers to cool and therefore avoid damaging the electronic parts. The following facilities can ensure proper ventilation in a computer room. The room should have large and enough windows and doors. Installing an air conditioning system. Installing a cooling system, that is a, a cooling fans. Installage, or you can install cooling fans. You can avoid overcrowding or either machines or people in the room. Avoid overcrowding of either machines or people in the room. That is, those are some of the measures that you can take to make sure that the computer lab has ventilation. Then we have dust control. Set up the computer laboratory in a location away from excessive dust. Remove your shoes before you enter the computer lab to prevent dust. The computer lab should be fitted with special curtains that would reduce entry of dust particles. The floor should be covered with a carpet in order to observe dust and also observe the noise made by chairs. Cover the computer devices with dust covers when not in use or when cleaning the computer lab. Those are some of the measures to control uh, uh, that is dust. Then we have Damp control. Damp is humidity, water, or moisture. Humidity in the computer lab must be regulated to maintain the optimum 50%. If the humidity is low, it allows static electricity to build up and causes damage to sensitive electronic components. Similarly, high humidity of over 70% causes rusting of the metallic parts of the computer system. Therefore, you have to control the humidity. You can install dehumidifiers. Then you can talk about the standard furniture and posture. There is the way you need to uh, sit to uh, protect your energy, to, pro to protect your health. The table stroke bench on which a computer is placed must be strong and wide enough to bear the weight and accommodate all the peripheral devices. The seat for the user must be comfortable and have a straight backrest that allows someone to sit upright. This prevents muscle pain, backache, and also uh, eye ache. Adjust the furniture to meet your need for comfort. For example, adjust the height of the chair or working uh, service so that your forearms are parallel with the floor 
and your wrist are straight. The seat must be high enough relative to the table to enable the user use the hands on the keyboard comfortably. The eyes must be at the same level with the top of the screen to avoid straining. Therefore, those are some of the important part on the when you talk about the standard uh, furniture. Then, starting up a computer or booting, uh, booting a computer. Now, before switching on a computer, make sure that all the components are properly connected and that the computer is connected to an active power source. Turn on the switch at the source of the power supply. If the computer is connected to a constant voltage stabilizer or a UPS, turn it on after switching the main supply. Turn on the switches on the system unit at the monitor. Switch on the power button on the monitor first, then followed by the system unit. After the power is on, the computer automatically goes through a process called booting, and therefore let's define now booting. Booting is a term used to describe the starting up of a computer. It is the entire process that makes the computer ready for use, and therefore booting is the process by which computer starts up. When the computer is starting up, there is a process that it goes uh, or that goes uh, on. This process is called booting. And therefore, you can be given six marks, four marks, depending on the teacher, to explain the booting process of a computer. And therefore, this is what happens. When power is switched on, the computer starts by checking all its components to determine whether they are available for use and whether they are functioning correctly. This is called power on self test or post. Therefore, when you press the power button, the computer undergoes through a process called post, power on self test. And this is whereby it checks whether all the gadgets in it are attached and working. Then the next point, post prepares the computer for use by instructing it to perform a number of diagnostic tests when booting up. It instructs the computer to check the memory called RIM to make sure it is operating correctly. Then it checks the CMOS. CMOS is a battery that makes sure that the dates carried are on always. It stands for complementary metal oxide semiconductor. And therefore it checks the CMOS, BIOS, hard disk controller, floppy disk drive, and the keyboard. During this process, some monitors display information showing the status of each device being tested. If a problem is found, for example, in the case one of the device is faulty or missing, the process will stop and display an appropriate error message on the screen indicating to the user where the problem is located. Sometimes an error code is displayed with the message or an abnormal number of beeps are sounded. The special program that directs the power on self-test is called BIOS or Basic Input Output System. Now there are steps for the machine. If all gadgets are connected, if everything is functioning and attached, then the operating system is loaded from the hard disk to the main memory through a process called bootstrap loader or bootstrap. And therefore, this is a very long story and explanation of how a computer works. That is, this is what happens behind the computer when you are waiting it to boot, to tell you welcome and uh, you start using. Now that we have uh, seen what is booting, there are two types of booting. We have cold booting and warm booting. Code booting happens when you start a computer that was initially off. When a computer was totally off and then you start it, then you are doing code booting. But when your computer is on and because of one reason or the other, like installation of a new hardware, installation of a new software, removal of a software, then you can restart or refresh. That is called warm booting. Warm booting is restarting a computer. 
whereas code booting is starting a computer that was initially off. Then some people uh, encounter problems when uh, shutting down a computer and therefore there is the correct procedure of shutting down a computer or turning a computer off. After finishing working with the computer, the user must follow the correct procedure of shutting down the computer in order to ensure that some uh, that loss of data, damage of programs and computer components does not occur. Therefore, before shutting down the computer, save all the work done on the computer and close all running programs. Remove any floppy disk. Remove, okay, nowadays you don't use floppy disk. Therefore, remove any flash disk or any DVD that is there. Then follow the, uh, the, the correct procedure that is click start, then shut down, or click start, then turn off. It depends with the, uh, with the machine. Then after doing that, uh, press the power buttons off, that is for the monitor and for the uh, system unit after doing that. Therefore, that is the correct uh, procedure of uh, shutting down the computer. Therefore, let's go to the hands on skill on keyboard and mouse as we wrap up our topic. Keyboard. Now, we, uh, we somewhere checked at the keyboard. We said the keyboard is a keying device with the buttons and uh, it is used to give instructions to the computer. You saw a keyboard. That, uh, that is the area in the lesson as we, we were starting. And therefore, we shall uh, be looking at the keyboard. The keyboard is actually this gadget uh, in front of you in this video. It is a gadget that is used for typing and it is of several parts. Therefore, we have the uppermost left top corner. We have the escape key. Then we have the alphanumeric, that is alphabets and numbers. That's why it's called alphanumeric. It is a combination of numbers and uh, alphabets. Then we have special uh, keys. We have the longest button in the keyboard called spacebar for putting space. Then we have the arrow keys for playing computer games or navigation. Also, we have the cursor movement and editing keys. We have home, we have edit. Uh, those ones, they are located somewhere there. We call them CASA movement or editing keys. Then we have the, uh, the, the rightmost part, center part. We call it the numeric keypad. It is used for typing numbers or doing calculations. You can also use it for navigation when the num rock is off. Then we have the functional keys, F1 to F12, located at the uppermost part of the keyboard. Then from there, we can look at the sections of the keyboard now. Most keyboards have a total of one, one keys, but it depends. And then uh, which are divided into five different groups. We have functional keys. We have F1 up to F12. These are called special keys. They are used differently. They can be used to get help, to play music, to stop. They are just special keys. They are used for various uh, functions. Then we have alphanumeric keys. We have 0 to 9. We have the 26 alphanumeric A, B, C, D. Uh, those ones, they are used for typing. Then we have the numeric keypad. Uh, it usually has the division sign, time sign, minus, plus. It's used for uh, performing calculations. Then we have the CASA uh, positioning keys or editing keys, we have page up, page down, home, and those ones. Then we have the arrow keys, uh, that the ones that you can use for playing games. Then we usually have the, the tab key. The tab key is situated at your left. It is used for pressing space when you are doing paragraphing. Then we have the arrow keys, you have delete, backspace, for deleting then there is this very uh, uh, very confusing concept there is this button called space bar for putting space there, there is backspace backspace is for uh, deleting characters towards the left hand side then there is delete delete is for deleting characters from the right 
then from there uh, you can look at your keyboard and run more uh, as you practice that is as you practice typing then you have mouse now mouse we had uh, looked at the mouse and therefore we shall only go to the terminologies of the mouse therefore this is the mouse the mouse looks like this uh, it has the palm rest uh, or the casing uh, the, the the point detent casing that's where the palm rest is that's where your palm rest then you have the cable you have the left mouse button uh, we also have the right mouse button but we also have mouse with a uh, scroll wheel a button that uh, you are you use it to scroll uh, for scrolling therefore we have terminologies associated with the mouse therefore the mouse can be used to select or to point the mouse can be used for clicking the mouse can be used for double clicking the mouse can also be used for right clicking and uh, also for scrolling and therefore when you talk about clicking clicking is pressing the left mouse button once and releasing it to select an item the action is to select an item then we have double click double click is to press the left mouse button in quick succession to open a file or to open a program then we usually have right click right click is used as shortcut it is used to display a shortcut menu sometimes you may opt to move something from one position to the other using the, the mouse button we call that one drag and drop therefore you can uh, you can drag and drop you hold you point to the item you want to drag you press and hold down the left mouse button or even the right mouse button then you slide the mouse until the pointer reaches the desired position that is called then you release your finger that is called drag and uh, drag and drop and therefore that is the end of our topic that is introduction to computers i have also done the next topic uh, computer systems i have also done the last topic in form one syllabus that is the operating systems therefore you can still get them uh, the description below this video down there you can also visit my website www.gichaidon.co.ke get the address below this video to get these notes and other materials also remember to subscribe so that you can get all the videos as i do them